uh, I think we should just try and get head. this going. Oh, great. How does that, that looks like you can see that. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. There we go. Excellent. Perfect. Okay, so now let me put this somewhere where uh, I- All right, so I'm gonna mute myself and go back to YouTube. Thanks. Okay, great. So let me just go backwards so you can see what I was saying before. So, uh, uh, so the words actually go uh, with what's on the screen. Uh, so uh, my, my intent is to have some place, different places where people can learn things and step off and they'll still somehow become a better person for it. Uh, and so just some examples are listed here and I mentioned them, which is thinking categorically, learning about sheaves, thinking about geometric spaces and implying this in the case of varieties and schemes. Uh, and where you are the notes, well, I said it in words and now it's on the screen and now it's going. Uh, and my plan again is to do four different things uh, if there's time uh, in, uh, but not maybe in the logical order exactly. And that's where we are. Okay, uh, and maybe I should check. Okay, so apparently this is 720, not 1440, is that right? But hopefully it's still readable. And uh, uh, so let's go to geometric spaces and let me just continue our discussion from last time. Uh, and so just as a reminder of what I want you to do, uh, you should have your favorite class of geometric spaces in mind. I do want to have be able to switch between one and another, but you really should have your, your favorite one in mind. And just for concreteness, uh, as we talk, I, I want to discuss, uh, I'll just talk about complex manifolds, uh, just so I can actually talk about something concrete, but you should be able to cut and paste to uh, smooth manifolds. Uh, this is over the real numbers or analytic, uh, real analytic manifolds or complex analytic varieties, which we have now basically defined. And soon, or maybe you already know about these examples of varieties, schemes, and algebraic spaces. Uh, and uh, so, okay, great. So now I want to observe in the geometric category that you're thinking about uh, the, the following thing. So, uh, so we're thinking about these kinds of spaces as, uh, as a set, uh, but it's really a topological space. Uh, and uh, so a set with a, uh, so to first order to set the second order to topology. And then the third order, uh, it's a ringed space. It's got a sheaf of functions, which we're calling O. Uh, and I've, one thing we've observed a couple of weeks ago is that if you have any point uh, inside your space, then you have your stock of your sheaf of functions. And then these functions, there's an evaluation map at the point. Uh, and in the case of complex manifolds, you take your, your germ of a function. So you have your tiny, uh, so a function, so, what, so what's, a, what's a germ? Uh, it's like you're remembering a little bit of a function. Uh, uh, so you have a representative uh, function on some small open set and two such germs are really the same germ if they agree on an even smaller open set. And then the th thing about germs, you can evaluate at the point. And so you get a complex number. Uh, and that is uh, the evaluation, that's, that's an evaluation map. And so you can have the kernel of that map, those things that have value zero. And maybe partially, so you can think about the real numbers if you're thinking about real man man manifolds, but not so uh, somewhat secretly, it's because I want to use this notion later on, uh, you may have a different field inside here. So let me just call this field the field, the residue field at a point and that K is like a kappa since Ks kind of often uh, are called fields. Okay, so in the examples you know, the, uh, this is a max, M sub P is a maximal ideal, uh, and it's the only maximal ideal. In other words, this is the, the stock. Uh, so I just got a request to uh, update the slides, just so you know. Great, so uh, a local, uh, so, so this is a local ring. Okay, and the way you actually, the way we saw what this was uh, is, uh, I was for the following fact, which came up in your comments and in discussions a couple of weeks ago, which is that you use the fact that if you have a function on an open set, the locus where it vanishes, which I want to call just so we have a word for it, the vanishing set, any function vanishes on a closed set. The locus where it's zero is a closed subset. So uh, uh, that's just a reminder, and that's what we expect to see in any sense. It looks like a geometric space. 
Okay, so then, uh, so what's a map of complex manifolds? Well, what I really mean is what, what uh, so we know roughly what we want it to be of a picture in a head. And so we're looking for what the morphisms are in the category of complex manifolds. And so we're trying to figure out what it should be. Uh, so what's the only reasonable answer? The only reasonable answer uh, is that we have our local model, uh, our complex, if we have a map from X to Y, let me call this morphism pi, then uh, our local model or local chart uh, is going to look uh, like uh, some open subset of, of complex M space. And so let me just pick coordinates, call them X1 through XM. Um, and we map from one local model uh, to another lo so to a local model, to a, a nice open set in the source, to a nice open set in the target. And the target's got nice local coordinates too. And so this map should be by way of a bunch of holomorphic functions or whatever functions you're, that you're talking about. So you have uh, a map uh, where you have, uh, so you have, uh, I deliberately put let M be the dimension of X and N is the dimension of Y. Uh, and we have N functions and M variables where each of these functions are holomorphic. So, uh, so that should be what the definition is. And as I'm describing it, it's not well defined yet. It's not really a definition. So you if you buy this, uh, if, you, if you think you buy this or you do buy this, you should try to turn this uh, into an actual rigorous definition. And then we'll do that soon too as well. So let me constantly remember to refresh. Okay, so let me unpack this a little bit. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so let me restate that. Uh, what this means is you have this map of topological spaces. Uh, so, you, so, it's a, so this thing here is better be a continuous map. Uh, and then what we're saying is that the pullback of Y1 or Y2 on the target space uh, is, uh, is a function uh, on, on you. Uh, and uh, just pull back in the obvious way. And we're requiring it to be a holomorphic function. Uh, so in other words, if I want to say this in a more, uh, in some more general way, we want to say that we've got this function, which is a pullback of yi. Uh, and then this should be inside uh, the space of functions on u. Uh, and so more generally, uh, but this is going to be equivalently, I, uh, I want to point out that if you have any holomorphic function on V, so it's a holomorphic function of the YIs, then when I pull it back, it's going to be a holomorphic function on U. And so it's more general because you're considering more functions, but it's not more general because if the YIs are all holomorphic, any holomorphic function of them is also holomorphic. Uh, and so when you say it this way, uh, let me write this down in some more formal way. Uh, what this is saying is that if you take the functions on V, and you pull them back, you get uh, functions on U, or even more generally, just on the open set that's a preimage of V. And so now I've said something in a way that has no coordinates in the name. There are no YIs or XIs here. I'm saying for if every open set V, the space of functions of nice functions, the ones that you like, uh, pull back to nice functions on U, that's a morphism. If, if that's true for every V, that's what we want to be a morphism from X to Y. Okay, so uh, so that is so uh, I, I want to take some. I want to keep going with this, and we'll come back to this more in a little bit. Uh, but that's all I wanted to say for now about geometric spaces. Now I want to go back to make sure we to go back to say a bit more about shapes. Now let me. Uh, so uh, at, at this point, uh, let me know uh, if there are things back there that people are uh, curious about to ask about now. But now let me just discuss sheaves. Uh, and let me just uh, remind you uh, that, uh, about how we are thinking about working with sheaves. Uh, so the initial definition that I described was by open set, open set by open set, which I find to be really natural when you're talking about functions or maps. And so op opens up by open set, the definition of pre-sheaf is especially nice. And the notion of the push forward sheaf, uh, it's easy to say what that is, uh, because if you have a more map of topological spaces and a sheaf, I can tell you what these sections of the push forward sheaf are over uh, any open set inside Y, because I just take a look at the pre-image and I look at the sections of F in it. 
So, uh, so the definition of push forward is really reasonable. Uh, and another thing we can do instead is work stock by stock, which is what we're talking about right now. And this is going to be good for sheaves, as we'll see soon. And later on, it's good for pulling back functions as well. Uh, and something in between the two, which I also want to talk about today, uh, is instead of all open sets, if you consider just certain nice open sets, uh, this is something which somehow lives in between these two notions. Uh, it's some of the open sets, so your ideas about open sets work, and it connects well to stocks as well. So we'll talk about that in a second. Great. So let me discuss sheaves by way of their uh, by way of their stocks. Um, okay. So last week we discussed that if we have a sheaf uh, uh, on a topological space X, then we have this natural map where we take the sections of the sheaf over U, uh, and we just take the germ, take all of their germs. So I can think. I realize that this is supposed to be a COVID-themed, uh, uh, this uh, COVID-themed uh, event. Then this is like a COVID map because this is like we take all the germs at once, and that's what you're remembering here. Uh, and so the, the key statement is that this map, when you, if you know all the germs, uh, is an injection. And the reason this is true, so, uh, so just to be clear, if you have a section, then I want to take this to all the germs of that section, all the points. And why is that true? Well, if you have, if you have two sections over U and they have the same germs, well, what does that mean? Well, it means near a point P, uh, then if I, then, if I take that, I've got a germ FP and a G and GP. And the fact that you get the same germ means that there is an honest open set. Uh, let me call this V sub P on which F equals G. Uh, that's the meaning of having the same germs. Uh, and then that's true near every single point. So if two functions are equal near every single point by the identity axiom, if you wish, uh, they must be the same function, the same section. So the question then is, what is the image? Uh, how do we identify, uh, how do we know if I give you a whole bunch of germs of functions near every point uh, or sections, how do you know if they actually come from an honest section? And the answer is actually pretty straightforward uh, if you think about it. And I should say, here's something which I, I think uh, is not so complicated when you think about it the right way, but it, it feels complicated and it's hard to get your head around. And this is a bit of an aside. I, I think I, I remember seeing a, colloquium talk by uh, a logician, Harvey Friedman, where he said something which made sense to me, which is the things that people find more confusing is when you have multiple nested quantifiers. If there's something like if for all, then there exists some. So this is why deltas and epsilons are hard the first time you see it, and frankly, the 25th time you see it, because you've got nested quantifiers and you will get uh, more confused than if there's just one. And it's the same reason why Categories are more complicated than sets. Two categories are more complicated than categories, and infinity categories are infinitely complicated. So this is going to be confusing for only that reason. So this, uh, so here's the statement. So if, if, you, if I give you a whole bunch of germs of different sections, uh, so a whole bunch of germs, one for every point inside you, how do you tell if there's an honest section uh, that has those germs? And the answer is, well, if there is an honest section, then what must be true is that the germs are com somehow compatible with each other. And I have sort of this picture in mind that if I tell you if, I, if I've got uh, my open set U and I tell you about like a little bit of a function, a little bit of a function, and they're really so little, like I, they don't really connect to each other, but they should somehow, because the germ of a function should be a, an honest section nearby, uh, somehow these germs should be compatible with each other. Okay, so that, that was incomprehensible. So let me just try to, say it in a different incomprehensible way. So what I mean is that for any point, uh, you've got your germ. And what's a germ? Well, anytime I hear about a germ, I think of an, that there's an honest open set with an honest section over that open set. And this is an equivalence relation. And so what this means, uh, what I want is that if I've got my point P, that there should be an honest open set. Uh, maybe not the first one. You may pick a very big representative and where this is going to work is going to be in a smaller open set where the germs, where the S of P's uh, are all the 
germs of this actual representative. In other words, near P, this is, these are the germs of an honest section. So there's something with quantifiers. So if you have, uh, so that means there exists, uh, I guess I even threw out a quantifier. There exists an open set, uh, an open neighborhood of P inside you. Then there's an honest section uh, over that open set such that the germ of that section gives you the right, gives you the right germ, gives you the hopeful germ everywhere inside that open set. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a, that's, that, you have to meditate on that a bit to get happy with it. Uh, and so if you want to have sort of a picture of this, then you might imagine that for every point P, you've got this, maybe I'll make, uh, this is supposed to be more agricultural, so I might I mean this to be yellow like corn, uh, like wheat, sorry, not corn. Uh, uh, and, and so for every point you have a uh, stock and what you want is to choose uh, a germ, an element of each stock in some consistent, coherent way. So uh, that's the picture you should have. Okay, so I said, uh, that, uh, I, so I said, don't worry about the Espas HLA construction. Uh, and so right now, Jonathan is uh, thinking that, wait, that is what you just described is the SPAS ATLA construction. Uh, and so I will pretend I didn't hear that. So, okay, so let me update. Great. Okay, so now I want to discuss sheafification. And I know bunches of you are already thinking through it if you hadn't seen it before because of the comments you've had uh, on Zulip. And then the, the first question of why is sheafification is something which I will leave, which needs to be answered. But let me just uh, de deliberately hold off. And then I don't mind holding off so long as I feel guilty about holding off. Uh, so, uh, so what is the sheafification? Well, let me just say two versions. This is always the, there's this sort of a suffix ification, uh, which is not in the dictionary yet, but it should be. Uh, if the sheafification turns something into a, it turns a pre-sheaf into a sheaf. And so version one is that given a pre-sheaf, it's the data of this entire map to another pre-sheaf, which happens to be a sheaf. And it's universal so that whenever you map F to another honest sheaf, the actual sheaf, then the only way to map from this pre-sheaf to the sheaf is by way of your sheafification through here. In other words, there exists a single, there exists a map making the triangle commute and it's unique. And then translation is this is just an adjoint statement with three actual functors, which is to be look set, to make it look a little bit fancier. For every honest sheaf, we have a bijection between maps of pre-sheaves from F to G. And of course, in what category we're we working, it's in pre-sheaves. So secretly there's a forgetful functor in there. Uh, and that's the same as uh, maps of sheaves from the sheafification to G. And so these two notions are really the same and, you, and it's sort of the sort of thing you've seen before. Great, and so does it exist? Uh, so the good thing is it, because we defined it by universal property, if it exists, it's unique. I'll tell you guys more of this. And so all I have to do is tell you what it is. And there are many possible ways of saying what this is and this is only one of them. And so what you do is you just cook up what it is. So, uh, uh, and now that we have the, now that we have the uh, compatible germs, uh, whoops, I should say compatible germs here. That th you can just define the sheaf of compatible germs as the sheaf of, of where over every open set you want compatible germs. Uh, and then I guess first you should check that this language makes sense and that it is actually a sheaf. And so you should think about that and it's fairly self-evident that it is by definition. Secondly, that there's a map from F to its alleged sheafification. And that's again cheap because on any open set, uh, you take a section and you send to all of its germs and they're obviously compatible. So that's good. And so th then also, if you think about this, it's also this thing you constructed every, uh, it is surjective, uh, uh, ooh, I shouldn't say on stocks, uh, but it's, uh, no, I should say on stocks. It's surjective, they have, uh, this map is surjective at the level of stocks. And then finally, you have the, uh, finally, you have this, you know, we have to just check the universal property. And so this is that there is a map and that it's unique. 
well, what does this map have to be? The best thing to do is to think about why there has to be such a map, that if you have a map of pre-sheaves, really every germ of, of, uh, of F maps to germ of G. And they do so compatibly if you figure out what that means. And then more so, this map is determined. And so there's a unique such map. So this is something where I can just say it, but you really have to check and make yourself happy uh, that this is uh, that this is eminently checkable and true. Okay, so now comes the why part. So uh, the why will be maybe by example. So uh, the co-kernel sheaf. Uh, if you have a, uh, uh, we know that there's a co-kernel pre-sheaf, uh, which is if you have a morphism of pre-sheaves, then you can have a co-kernel pre-sheaf, which has uh, I could define it, but it comes predefined if you know what a co-kernel is. It just means that there's, it satisfies some universal property. That is what you really, you're secretly thinking about whenever you use that word. But if you're working with sheaves, if you have a morphism of sheaves, then you do have a co-kernel pre-sheaf, but it might not be a sheaf. Uh, and so how do you find the co-kernel sheaf? Well, I could just define it as this, but I'm not allowed to um, uh, because I, the co-kernel sheaf comes predefined by universal property. My, but my claim is that if we were to take the pre-sheaf co-kernel and sheafify it, that will be what you mean by co-kernel sheaves. And the proof is really cheap now that we're thinking categorically. Well, what does it mean for the co-kernel pre-sheaf to be a uh, co-kernel? It means that if you have a map of, so here we have a map of sheaves, which are also pre-sheaves. And anytime we have a map to any pre-sheaf H uh, from G, that actually is zero when restricted F, when, when, the, this, when this composition is zero, then what that means is there's a universe, that there exists a unique map of pre-sheaves from this pre-sheaf co-kernel to H. And we've checked already that the pre-sheaf co-kernel is a co-kernel category pre-sheaves. Okay, so what do we need to do to check that this works on the level of sheaves as well? Well, it says now, if H is a sheaf, we want to check that there exists a unique map like this, making this commute. And how do we know that? Well, I should say a map like this. Uh, and so we have a map like this. Uh, and we already know that if there's a map like this making this commute, then there exists a unique map of pre sheaves making this commute. But then the universal property of sheafification says that therefore we have a unique map like this making this commute. So it's something which is completely formal and is essentially a two-liner once you have the definition that this will give you what you think of as the co-kernel sheaf. Uh, okay, that will tell you that it exists, but it won't tell you how you should think about it uh, correctly. So if you have a, um, so let's think about the co-kernel. So if you have a morphism of sheaves of a billion groups, uh, and, and just as an explicit example that if, you, if it's a subsheaf, if F to G is an injection, uh, and then we're, this is just the quotients. We're trying to make sense of the notion of a quotient sheaf. So, uh, so the answer, how to think about it, well, I guess I could have said it category, answer zero is categorically, which is how we defined it. But then in, one way of doing it was in terms of stocks. In terms of stocks, uh, you, it turns out, and you should check that the co-kernel sheaf, if you take it stock, is the same as the co-kernel uh, of the stocks. And maybe the way to say it in between is it's also the stock of the pre-sheaf co-kernel as well. So this is something which is something which I'll, I'll put down as, uh, as suggested homework, uh, just to really see, so you understand in your gut why this is, why this is the case. Uh, okay, so that's the stock level. Now on level open sets, you also can understand it. So what is not true uh, is, in general, is that the co-kernel uh, uh, is equal to somehow the co-kernel of, maybe I should have said it this way, the co oh, well, this is not no longer, not, is, maybe I should say the co-kernel of the map from F to U to G of U. You can't do it open set by open set. So this thing which I wrote down here is, not true in general, but you can think about it in the following way. And this is something which is worthwhile homework too, because it lets you think about what quotients are. So 
the, the statement I'm going to say is not going to be precise. And then you have to try to, you have to first want to make it precise and then you have to make it precise. So uh, what I want to say is that if I give you the following data, you'll have, an, you'll have uh, a section of the co-curve. And then the follow-up question is, well, there's some equivalence relation on what I'm saying and what is the equivalence relation. So a section of the kernel uh, is given by, can be given by, uh, you take your U uh, of, and, and it's got a cover, open cover by smaller opens. And I want sections of G over each of these smaller opens. And on each of these, uh, and then I furthermore want that on the intersection of any two of them, uh, I want the difference not to be zero. They don't come from an actual, uh, they don't come from an actual section of G, but I want it to be the image of something in F. So in other words, uh, this map from F to G, the co-kernel, you can't do open set by open set, but any section of the co-kernel comes from uh, some smaller open sets. Okay, so that's something to think about. And you only, I, I can only expect that this is very confusing sounding um, uh, when you just see it and you have to actually understand what's true. Okay. Now, uh, I also want to uh, uh, talk about this third way of understanding sheaves, uh, where you just consider not all open sets, but open sets that are somehow nice. And what does nice mean? Well, nice means, uh, you tell me what nice means. Uh, it's uh, nice in some way or other that, for example, if you wanted to consider open sets in C to the N, it's easier to think about balls. So for, for real manifolds, if you like deltas and epsilons, you want to have balls as well, or maybe poly disks if you're in, in the complex setting. So the base of a topology or the basis of a topology, I feel like maybe basis is a better word uh, than any uh, open subset is, is a union of some of these special nice open subsets. That's the definition of a base. And you could believe uh, that if you have a, if you want to understand a sheaf on, uh, um, on uh, a manifold or on some metric space, that it should be enough to understand what the sheaf is on uh, on these nice open sets uh, and what the restriction maps are on these nice open sets, and that should be enough to be able to glue things together over any open set. So, uh, so that's what you should believe. And so, certainly, uh, if you have a sheaf, you can get a map. You can get a. You can get. Just remember the information only involving these nice open sets. Uh, and uh, I, actually, maybe before I go on, I should say there are various levels of niceness you can have. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so you could have a base that's particularly nice, uh, where, uh, where uh, hold on one second, I want to make sure I don't miss something. Uh, oh, so the first thing I should say is you have your, right, you have your base uh, and it, things can be really, really nice where, you, for, for example, the intersection of uh, two of your open, nice opens is also in your a nice open. So for example, in, in a metric space, uh, you have notion of convex sets and the intersection of two convex sets is also, or also convex. Wait, and I, okay, let me not even say metric space. I shouldn't think. In the appropriate kind of space, con, if there's a notion of convex, the intersection of two convex, it should be convex. So that could be a, a really nice, kind of base where the intersection of two opens, nice opens is also nice. You could also have a terrible variant of base where I'm not even gonna remember all the inclusions. I want to remember not all the Bi's inside Bj's. I'm gonna only remember some of them and somehow enough of them. And why you'd wanna tie your hands behind your back when thinking about uh, section over sets while well, that's uh, only if you're a terrible person, uh, so you'll see it later on, and uh, uh, you may have to deal with these terrible things. So, uh, so the, these are these two variations. One is when it's particularly nice, and one is where I, I make I relax the definition to make it more terrible. And if you're thinking in a fancy way of uh, the t the category of open sets, which you are, some of you, many of you already are. Uh, so, your the notion of topology, what you really need to remember. Are what the open sets are and what uh, and what the inclusions are, uh, and you have uh, furthermore a little bit more information of when some things are an open cover, and then you can have the situation where you have a particularly nice such category and a particularly terrible such category that you want to think about. Okay, so forget uh, 
so forget all that. Uh, and so now let me go back to the main part of the story, which is if you have a sheaf on X on a topological space, it should be enough to just, so you certainly can just remember the sections over these nice open sets and restriction maps that you want to remember. And conversely, uh, if I give you things that are over each of these open sets uh, and things that look like restriction maps, there should be some rule to let you know when it actually comes from a sheaf on an actual sheaf on X. And so there should be some sheafy type conditions. So let me say what they are. Uh, and so to say it in a somewhat uh, laborious way, yeah, uh, if you have a base for the topology, we can define the notion of a sheaf on this base where, and this is going to be, these are going to be uh, a sheaf of sets, but you could just search and replace sets by rings, abelian groups, or anything you want. Uh, and so we need to have a set for every basis, uh, not just for every, not for all the open sets. And we better know what the restriction maps are for uh, whenever we have an inclusion. And so we want this to form something that looks like a pre-sheaf. In other words, when we restrict and we restrict, it should be the same as restricting all at once. So restricting from a big open set to a, to a smaller, to a smallest is the same as restricting all the way at once. So that's just the notion of a pre-sheaf. And then what's the identity axiom? Here's where something gets interesting. Uh, and you have to think a little bit because you're gonna even have some choices, which is if you have two, uh, two sections over some basic op open set, and I want to say that they agree locally, then they must be the same. And what do I mean by agree locally? Well, I could mean that they agree for every open set contained, uh, uh, every contained inside, every basic open set contained inside B, or maybe I could mean if it's a nice, uh, if it's a nice base, that they should agree on the intersection, which is also now in a base, or maybe I could mean for a cover. So uh, what? So the question is, what do I mean? And the answer is, I don't know, because it doesn't matter. All these things are equivalent, but this is something to to, to meditate on, uh, uh, to understand, to figure out what's going on. And then finally, we have a movability axiom, which says that if we have a cover of, of the base by by other basic open sets, and we have sections over to the smaller guys, and they agree on the pairwise overlaps, which you've already had to figure what that means, then they come from an honest section. So that's the only reasonable definition of a sheaf on a base. And the only thing to really figure out is what you want to mean um, by this. Uh, and then uh, the point I want to make is if I tell you, if I give you a sheaf on the base, not an actual sheaf, you can still make sense of germs of sections. And uh, so, and that's just because if you've got, uh, if you have a basic open set, well, what or what's a germ near P of a sheaf? Well, it should be an honest section over some, I guess, basic open set. And we have this rule that if we have a section over this basic open set and over that basic open set, we want to declare them to be the same germ if they agree on some even smaller open set containing P inside there. And now you have no idea what I drew there, but hopefully you remember what that's supposed to look like. And if you want to, so that's it means something very concrete, but it also literally word for word because of the what, what the definition of colimits is, it's a colimit. And now if you're uh, if you're thinking about the category of open sets, you, or if you're a topologist of the more algebraic sort, you can't help but thinking of this. And then you realize the category of open sets you're thinking about is a filtered index category. And then suddenly you're thinking about all these things from uh, that chapter on category theory. So in other words. You can make sense of germs, and then you can make sense of compatible germs, and then you have a sheaf of compatible germs, and it's an honest, honest sheaf on X. So now that means if you have a sheaf on X, well, you could just consider, remember what happens on the base and get a sheaf on the base. But now, if you have a sheaf on the base, you get an actual sheaf. And now you can check that the, these, are the, these, are, uh, these are somehow the same. I could say it in a fancy way by equivalence of categories, but that's... Uh, uh, but I don't want to. Uh, and you have to check that when you go in this direction, followed by this direction, you get the, the basically the identity uh, and in the other direction too. Okay, so that is, uh, that's uh, what I wanted to say about, uh, about sheaves today. And that's most of what I want to say about sheaves. Oh, I guess there is one last thing 
I did want to say, which is that uh, sheaves of abelian groups on X form uh, an abelian category. And what I mean is just that if you have a map of abelian groups, you can make sense of co-kernel, kernel, uh, image, etc., and it behaves just the way that you want it to. Uh, all the usual things are satisfied. So why is that true? Well, what is the co-kernel? Well, you just have to work stock by stock, and you could just work out what the kernel is. Uh, of, uh, the you know the stocks, and you want them to be compatible. So essentially, to compute the kernel or the co-kernel of the image, you just do it stock by uh, stock by stock, germ by germ, and the compatibility comes for free. So that's basically the proof. That's that's it. Uh, because you understand maps of abelian groups, uh, that means you understand maps of, uh, of germs and their incompatibility comes for free. So kernels and co-kernels just work. So that's the uh, so that is yeah. Well, that's that's just how best to say it. Uh, yeah, best thing to say is, great, it just works. So you don't need to remember the definition of the million category at all. Okay, that normally, when you write a paper, you should not do things like this, but uh, fortunately no one will remember this. Okay, so now let's take, let, let's, uh, uh, let's apply this to varieties and schemes. Uh, so, okay, so now we know what geometric spaces want to be, uh, which is that uh, if we wanted to find a new kind of geometric space, we need to figure out what, uh, we need to describe what the local model is. It's gonna be a ring space. We're gonna define these ring spaces. And so they're gonna be sets. Uh, and these sets are gonna have functions on them that we're gonna count, call, that'll be the kinds of functions we legitimately want to think about. So for example, holomorphic manifolds, local models will be open subsets of C to the N, or maybe they'll be balls in C to the N or polydisks. And we have the holomorphic functions on those that we're allowing. And then we want the set to actually be a topological space. So we can, uh, uh, and that will allow us to talk about a sheaf of functions. And then we basically have defined it already because our new kind of geometric space is a ring space that locally looks like the ring space that we are considering. So that is, what we have to do in, for any kind of new space. So let's, let's, let's do it and let's see what happens. Okay, so now I'm gonna define simultaneously a bunch of different things, uh, except I don't want to. I want to define one single thing. And what am I going to be talking about? I'm talking about one of four things and you pick what I'm talking about. Um, I feel like if you've never seen this before, uh, if you have seen it all before, you should pay no attention uh, uh, and just work with schemes, or if you've seen varieties completely, you should work with schemes. But basically, you should take the first example in this list that you have not seen and made friends with. So I could talk about complex varieties, or I could talk about uh, varieties over an algebraically closed field, or varieties over a general field, or more general scheme. So these, so the first three are examples of affine varieties. I should say the definition of variety. There's no universal uh, agreement on what the word precisely means. Uh, because people have different things they like adding and subtracting in the definition. So, okay, so what is the image we're trying, what's the thing we're trying to make sense of? Well, let me just describe it in complex n space. So the local model, just like with complex analytic varieties, which were things cut out in little open sets of C to the N uh, by a bunch of holomorphic functions. Here, since I'm gonna talk about things that are purely algebraic, I wanna talk about subsets of C to the N cut out by just a bunch of polynomials. So elements of uh, uh, of C join X1 to X to the N. And then similarly, over an algebraically closed field, I can just say the same thing. I want to have uh, the local model be subsets of K to the N cut up by polynomials of this. So that is going to be my set. And I can even tell you my functions. My functions are the restrictions of the polynomials to these sets. So I've already built the first part of what I want. Uh, okay, so I, but I'm going to say that, that in a better way. Uh, oh, that is way too big. Okay, so I've told you the geometric setting, but if you're not over an algebraically closed field, like you could, uh, I need to tell you better what you want. And maybe the key thing that, that people realized sometime in the first 
uh, in the middle third of the 20th century is that the naive thing isn't exactly right uh, here. In fact, you want to think carefully about this and then realize what you mean. And then that will tell you how to think geometrically. So in other words, your, your geometric intuition dictates the algebra uh, in some settings. That lets you refine your geometric intuition, which tells you a fancier algebra, algebraic definition. Okay, so now to set notation, let me use, there's uh, in English speaking countries, often rings are defined, are called R and they're kind of simpler. Uh, <clears throat> and so in the setting of varieties, I'll use R and it's gonna be a polynomial ring over a field where that field might be complex numbers are algebraically close. And I wanna ha and I have a bunch of equations which are gonna be polynomial. So I'll call P the polynomial ring and I'm gonna call I to the ideal of things that, that, uh, generated by these functions. And then in France, they're fancier um, and their food is better. I, and, but they use a different language. And so rings there are called A for NO. Uh, these are, uh, and so more generally, uh, the French will tell you how to make some sort of geometric space out of any ring whatsoever, not just these lame, uh, lame, lame English speaking ones. Okay, so in other words, if we're talking about varieties, we need to be talking about finely generated algebras over some field. And I guess we're gonna need another condition which I'll hold off on for a second. But then we're gonna later realize that we don't need very much at all in what we're going to do done correctly works for any, uh, works for any rate. So that is, that's the, uh, <clears throat> so now that's what the set should be. Uh, well, I haven't said what the set should be yet. Um, uh, so let me know where the functions are. This is seemingly strange. I'm gonna start with the functions and then tell you the set. But uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't. Let me just tell you the, the set first. Uh, so, so here's the set is going to be those maximal ideals of, uh, of, of our ring. And this is called M spec. Not the max spec, this is uh, M is for maximal. And so well, I want just the set of maximal ideals. And by the null Stellensatz, uh, one version over the complex numbers, this exactly corresponds to solving equations over the complex numbers. Uh, but then more generally, if you are dealing with more general rings, uh, I want to have not just the maximum ideals, but the prime ideals. So in other words, I want, to I, I want something bigger, potentially bigger, because um, uh, I want to have all prime ideals. So that's my set. And I, I need to say later on why, and I'm not going to say that just yet, but now I'll tell you what the functions are in the set. And so the functions are going to be just the, uh, just polynomials. And I want to point out something really obvious about functions, which is if you have a function on like a manifold or, or, or a set, um, and a function, if, if its square is zero, then its value is zero everywhere. So if f squared is zero, surely f is zero, right? So if that's going to be a ring of functions, uh, then we need to have this condition that whenever f to the n is zero, it must have mean f is zero to begin with, because that's, that's of course reasonable. So, uh, and I could put that in words, but the only null potent function is zero. So that's the reasonable extra condition you want to have uh, for varieties. And then maybe you want the same condition here, but then growth and will say, hold off a second, don't, uh, uh, don't, don't rush to judgment on this. So we'll, uh, but for now, uh, when we're doing with varieties, we're gonna have this, this requirement that no, the only null potent function is zero. If f to the n is zero, then f is zero. Okay. Great. So now I want to end with some examples. Uh, and when I end with some examples, I want to have, uh, I want to draw some pictures. And I want to say that for 99% of the people in the world, these pictures have value. And there's some people for whom they have no value. Uh, and these people are strange people. So if you look at EGA, you will find no pictures. Uh, and that is because pictures were not invented until later in the 20th century, uh, or more generally, because, well, I don't know why there are no pictures. I guess they didn't, I have no idea why there are no pictures. So the pictures help you understand what's going on. And let me just give you examples from your past, which is uh, when you learned linear algebra, or even before when you talked about R3, if I said, what is R3? You would, I think, draw on a blackboard or on your paper, something like this. And I want to point out to you that this is not literally true. That is not R3. This is, uh, 
It's a picture of R3, but you know what it means. And it doesn't bother you. And if that doesn't bother you, then I can have a picture of R4 uh, like that. And then if you're doing linear algebra and I tell you I've got three space over an arbitrary field, then you would draw a picture. And what picture you, would you draw? I think you would draw this because it would tell you your correct intuition. Uh, and then if I wanted a picture of C3, well, C is just an example of a field. So there is C3. And the pictures look exactly the same, but that's okay because this is telling you that in some essential way, these really are the same picture, there's some commonality. And you wouldn't complain, say, no, that's also real six dimensional, that's the wrong kind of picture. Um, uh, you would, the earlier version of you would throw your shoes at someone who said that. Okay, so let's keep that in mind and let's do some uh, uh, examples which you've been reading about. Uh, so if you have this very nice ring, then what is M spec of this ring? Well, uh, by, so what are the prime ideals of the polynomial ring? The prime ideals are just things of the form x minus a, where that's in complex, the complex numbers. These are the maximal ideals. Uh, and there's one other ide prime ideal that's not maximal, which is generated by zero. And you should know why this is true. And if you don't, and you're looking for the right thing to figure out in uh, this week while learning about this, it's this algebra fact, which is that you can uniquely factor polynomials and the prime factors of this form. And so if I want to draw a picture of this and I want to have uh, one maximal ideal for every complex numbers, what's my picture? My picture is just going to be a complex number. So there's my complex numbers. Maybe you'll say, well, that's not the complex numbers. The complex numbers is too real dimensional. Uh, uh, and so I should have it, drawn it like the argon plane. And I will say no, because you already it's too late. You've already told me I'm allowed to draw complex numbers like that. Uh, uh, and so that's my picture of M spec of the polynomials. And more generally, over an algebraic closed field, you get the same story. Uh, and now comes the question I want to be sure to discuss uh, live or in person, which is if you want to deal with spec of this ring, you have a new prime ideal zero. And the question is, where is it? Where does it go in this picture if we want a picture of it? So, uh, so the, que the question which I'll leave on hold for a bit is where do you draw this point? And actually, if you look behind Allison's head uh, in Zoom, you'll have the beginnings of answers for uh, where it might go. This is Mumford's picture of what actually, uh, of how to picture these things. Okay, now, let me do the next more complicated example, which is the polynomial ring in two variables. And let me tell you what the, what the maximal ideals are. Well, again, assuming we know the null Stellensatz, the maximal ideals are of the form x minus a comma y minus b, where a comma b is an ordered pair of complex numbers. So how do I picture that? That just looks like C2. So in other words, when I draw, I would draw M spec of this ring as C2. And I know that the point A comma B means really this maximal ideal. And this is really a good notion because what does, if I give you a polynomial and I say, what's its value at A comma B, that is, you plug in A comma B. And that is the same thing by the remainder theorem as modding out by this maximal ideal. So this completely fits in together with our, all of our previous discussion on local on functions van, uh, and where they vanish. So, but there are other prime ideals. I can tell you some right away. So for example, the prime, zero is a prime ideal. Uh, this polynomial is integral domain. Another prime ideal, well, if you have any irreducible polynomial, uh, and you were to take the principal ideal generated by it, then this is also prime. The translation, because for me, prime, just the right definition of a prime ideal is just that the quotient is an integral domain. So these are two prime ideals, kinds of prime ideals, and there are no more. And then a question is why, and this is algebra, but it's secretly geometry. So let me draw a picture of this a little bit before let me table uh, the question of C3 for a second, of C, X, Y, Z. And uh, let me 
make sure we update this. And so here's my picture of M spec of, so you join XY. And so that the, I know what the maximum ideals are. And now the, uh, this looks like C2. And now I've got additional points to fit. And for example, let me consider this irreducible polynomial. And then I can take the ideal generated by it, or maybe let me do a different one, x minus two. Uh, and so that's prime. And so there should be a point I should be able to draw. So let me draw where it is. Uh, and this is, uh, so uh, before I do, let me just tell you about, let me ask you some natural questions. If I were to say, consider the function uh, y minus x on C2. And I said, where does it vanish? The answer is, well, of course, y equals x equals zero. I should use a different color for this. Well, it's that line. So what does that mean? Well, the function vanishes at a comma b. That means that f is in the ideal generated by that. This is if and only if. So in other words, I can tell whether a fun function vanishes at a point, a maximum ideal, by simply checking if it's in it. So similarly, I can do the same thing here. My question is, uh, is this mystery point, that I, don't want, I don't know where to draw this new point, is it on this line? The answer is no, because y minus x is not in this prime ideal. So that means that wherever this mystery point is, it's not on that line. I can't draw it there. And similarly, is this mystery point at the point 2 comma 3? Or I guess it's 3 comma 2. In other words, that corresponds to x minus 3, y minus 2. And the answer is no, because this x minus 3 and y minus 2 are not uh, contained in this ideal. So I know this point, wherever it is, it's not on that line. It's not on this point. It's not here. But my next question is, is it on x, y minus 2y equals 0? Is it in that closed subset? What does that mean? Well, that's the union of the x-axis and a vertical line x minus 2. And the answer is yes, because this thing is in this ideal. So now this is the algebra geometry dictionary you have to become comfortable with and turn into your native language, or really it's a dictionary between two native languages. Uh, and so our mystery point is, is contained in this set. So, so I would say that this mystery point, is it contained in x equals 2? Yes, because x minus 2 is, because x equals 2, x minus 2 is in this ideal. Is it contained in y minus 3? No. So now I'm ready to tell you where the point is. And I, now I'm ready to tell you what's behind Allison's head. Uh, so if you uh, were to, uh, so where is this point? It's on this line, and it's nowhere in particular on this line. This is something which I, I do think is like this Zen, uh, the American version of Zen, perhaps, uh, idea of, uh, it, of it's, this point is somewhere, and it's hard to draw because it's on the line and nowhere in particular. Uh, and similarly, the prime ideal zero is going to be somewhere on the plane, but it's not on any curve. It's just somewhere out there. So I, I, I might draw it somewhere here because it's got to be, it, it's somewhere, but no one particular. Uh, and, and, and where's this one here? Well, it is, uh, there's my picture of this curve. Uh, it, it's a cuspidal curve uh, of, of y squared equals x cubed. And this point, well, it's on that curve, but nowhere in particular on the curve. It's not on this line, it's not in any axis. Uh, um, but it, uh, uh, but it is on that curve, and that's all I can tell you about it. And you, where, and so where do I draw it? Well, given that there's no room, I need to somehow squeeze it in. So you just do what Allison did, and you either stick your head in front of it, or you put some, uh, or you uh, kind of draw some squiggly point to say that it somehow is there without. Say, um. Okay, so the very last thing I'll say because uh, I should uh, uh, I should end soon is an indication of why things that are purely algebra secretly should be geometry. So if I had to say, what are, the, what are the points here? What are the maximal ideals? Well, that part is easy because the maximal ideals by the null stellen sets are just of the form something like this. And, and we should think of those as ordered triples. But there are other, but there are prime ideals as well. And I can tell you some, there's the zero ideal and there's also irreducible polynomials. And now, 
my picture of these is that this is a point in an old fashioned sense. This is a, like a, where F, this is a hypersurface, a surface in three space where you set the function to zero. And this is somewhere in three space, but not in any surface. So if you were to draw pictures, but well, you're missing some prime ideals. And an example is the prime ideal X comma Y. That's a prime ideal because the polynomial ring modulo this ideal is just going to be polynomials in Z. It's an integral domain, meaning this is a prime ideal. And so if you try to draw pictures, your picture here is going to be some old fashioned point. This is going to be a two dimensional thing. That'll be like the all of the three space. And this is some one dimensional thing. And it, we know what the zero dimensional quote zero dimensional primes are, the three dimensional and the two dimensional. But the one dimensional primes, that's exactly in a way we don't know how to make precise because we don't know even what dimension is. Knowing what the prime ideals of the polynomial and three variables is exactly the problem of knowing what the curves are inside three space. So the geometry is the algebra and the algebra is the geometry. So it's now three past. So let me just leave you with a couple of things. One is that you should do the examples uh, and that the odd bells and whistles to add are the integers where you, where somehow now this will begin to tell you how to think about this as a geometric space. At least you'll see what the set is. And you'll see crazy things like this thing here, this rational number, that's a function on some space. And it's got a pole at two, a double pole at two. It's got a triple zero at three. And it even has a derivative at five. Well, no, actually, well, uh, let me not say anything about that for a second. And then this thing is where here, what if the field is not algebraically closed? How do you picture this? Well, there's some thing in nature telling you how to picture it. And maybe if you want an algebra question, uh, something which I think is not so obvious, which is the maximum ideals of a polynomial ring over a field. Uh, somehow you can identify them where you just take elements of k bar to the n and you take Galois orbits. And for some reason, that should correspond to maximum ideals. And that's e that looks, if you think about it a little bit, you'll think it's not, it's clearly true. And if you think about it more, you realize it's not so easy. And if you think about it a lot, you realize, yes, it is true. And you know why it's true. OK, so now the last thing I want to say, just for the sake of experts, and you can, uh, th we'll talk about this a little bit uh, next time, which is just to do this thought experiment, which is if you understand open balls in C to the N, what would lead you to complex manifolds? And I've given you one possible answer in what we've talked about, but I want to give you a different kind of answer. Uh, and I just want to sit, ask you, set, the, set up the thought experiment, which is if you have your category of geometric spaces, like in this case, balls in C to the N or polys in C to the N, uh, then there, and then if you have uh, one of such things, or what I really mean is an object in this category, that's what this is always shorthand for, then it, let me remind you of two fundamental, fundamental facts about it. There's the Yoneda lemma, which says that inside the functor category, if you want to say this in a very fancy way, uh, the functor category are contravariant functors to sets. Uh, uh, and, but you, and morphisms are what, what you think they are, then the Uneda lemma, the Uneda lemma is that this map, there's a map, the Uneda functor is a faithful functor. That's what the Uneda lemma translates to. So that's one thing we know. Uh, a second thing we know is that maps to X glue, maps to complex balls glue, uh, the translation, they form a sheaf. So maps to X form a sheaf, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then the thing to notice is that, uh, uh, right, and the sheaf is, again, a contravariant functor from the category of open sets. It's, it's somehow the same language is in there. And the thing I would observe are twofold. First, any complex manifold, not just balls in C to the N, also satisfies both Yoneda's lemma that you can identify by its maps to it. That's a universal property thing. And uh, that they form a sheaf, maps to it form a sheaf. So, uh, so, not, ju so not just elements or original category, but even things you want to include satisfy both. And so the question is, what does it mean? How do you combine this to have a notion of something in the function category that forms a sheaf for all y? And then you will have a one-line definition almost of complex manifolds, uh, which will be completely incomprehensible unless you came to it in this way. And the example I'll leave, I'll discuss next week is projective space, which informally we think of as n plus one space throughout the origin and mod up by scaling. And so to say, it, you could try to say it in a sheafy way. Uh, and when you try to say it in a sheafy way, you need to sheafify 
Uh, and so, uh, and this is a great way to understand what, uh, why quotients are really interesting in geometry, not just, this applies not just in algebraic geometry. Okay, so that's a good place to end for the day. Let me make sure the slides are there. And I think now would be a good time for, for some discussion, but now is also a good time for people to uh, head to the exits as you head off to your next pseudo lecture in a different part of the uh, virtual world. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, please stick around and uh, after maybe like a 10 second pause so we can all catch our breath. Uh, if, uh, we'll go to questions and we'll ask questions. Let me check whether uh, uh, now if this is slightly tricky because I want to ask Taylor who's uh, delayed, but uh, it's possible Jack Garza wants to mention the problem exchange where people are, uh, uh, where, uh, where people can actually discuss solutions and trade solutions. Yeah. Uh, so, so we just caught it, so we just finished. So we're, yeah. that's where we are now. Um, so I'm catching up. Great. Uh, uh, so yeah, I saw that you were mentioning the problem exchange. So uh, people are making overleaf. So uh, so Zach wanted me to encourage people to self-organize, so the people in the groups, and then maybe make a shared overleaf to uh, uh, to submit to the problem session, to the problem group, or like the problem exchange. Uh, so this, is, yeah. this is really worth doing. I feel like you have to try to solve problems, and then you have to talk about them and see the problems you did not solve, but you tried to solve that. Those are, yeah. So please uh, check this out. I think this is worthwhile uh, if you can. Okay, so should we, so now for questions, I guess what we'll do is we will, uh, uh, I guess just we'll do, we'll do the same things last week and then uh, Taylor or others will yeah, just- Yeah, I, I, I can go. Uh, do you want me to just fire? Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, so is O being local uh, an assumption to make it a geometric space? So this is a so this is about sheaves, and there was another related question about um, so are all stocks of ring spaces local rings, or is this part of the definition of a locally ring space? Ah, great. So for for a geometric space, uh, so for a geometric space, the good thing is I never defined it. Uh, so. When you tell me, is it should it be part of a definition? Uh, uh, the answer is that it should be part of a definition, but we don't have one. Uh, uh, that 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 these are local rings. So and, I guess one not, of the things was I think they were looking for an example of um, maybe a geometric space which where the stocks are not local. Well, the, well, I guess there can't be by my definition. By my lack of a definition, that for me, I cannot imagine a geometric space where the stocks are not local. Uh, yeah. so, uh, so my def so uh, so anything that's geometric, this is going to be true. Although that's metaphysics, not mathematics yet. So, I, uh, but what I should say is that when people proved that OP was a local ring in a bunch of examples, their proof applies to lots of things. And, and that's why I wanted to isolate what made their proof work. What made them work is this fact that the vanishing set of functions, the locus where functions vanish is a closed subset. Whenever that's true, this will be true, that OP is a local ring. And so in particular, in such cases, you'll get locally ringed spaces. So, so long as those things are true, which I would think should be part of the definition of a geometric space, uh, it's just that no one, there's no official phrase geometric space that's defined in the world, except secretly among ourselves, uh, then it would be, they would have to be locally ring spaces. And ring spaces need not be locally ring spaces. And a really dumb example is just a one point space uh, where the, with, a source, with, with an associated ring R, I guess I should make sure it's not a field. Uh, and then that's, the, uh, uh, so um, maybe I'll be great. There's a ring that's not a, no, Z is even better. That's, yeah. that's a better. Yeah, and even when the objects are locally ringed, right? If you take morphisms in the category of ring spaces, those are not the same as morphisms of ring spaces. So that's something that you have to watch out for. Yes. So, so right now, define schemes. You do not want them to be defined in the category of ring spaces, uh, even though they are the the stocks are local. You need them to be defined in locally ring spaces so that the morphisms that uh, is local what, morphisms. I would like to hide that a little or phrase it slightly. Spoiler. Sorry. 
Uh, no, no, well, no, let me even say why. I want to say even why. That, um, so when we define what a geometric space is maps between them, we have local models. And, uh, and we can say that that's our definition of morphisms. And the phrase locally ringed spaces is not present in there at all. We don't need locally ringed spaces in, in that at all. So why do we need the notion of locally ringed spaces? We almost don't. It's just going to be incredibly easy. OK, let, so here's if they're the, locally like affine schemes, you're saying you just, yeah, then it's. It's for free. Or, or it's for free because it comes from maps of rings. Exactly, exactly. So it's, it's more like an observation yeah. that these maps of affine schemes or maps of locally ringed spaces. But the one reason to use it, and there, I think it's really useful to know when you use something and when you don't need it, uh, what is going to make it, where it will be really useful is, the, is in the following place, which is you could define maps of schemes or complex manifolds, et cetera, by things that locally look like this. And then you worry about the fact that, OK, I'm talking about, is it, is it enough to cover the target with these nice local models and cover the source and make them all work? Do I have to worry about compatibility? What if you have a different cover? And then your head starts to hurt. Uh, whereas, uh, as a kludge, it turns out that if you just take maps as locally ring spaces, uh, maps of complex, oh, I'll, I'll use words we don't know yet, maps of varieties, maps of schemes as locally ring spaces turns out to be just the same as mm -hmm. maps of affine. So I see it as a kludge, not a, as a, and now Jonathan is going to, I need to go back to the picture of Jonathan to, yeah. <laughs> Jonathan is thinking, is, is, I don't know what he's thinking, but he's thinking bad about <laughs> Uh, uh, but it's not, uh, uh, it's, uh, but I really don't think it is, the, it, it's useful to think about locally ring spaces because, because it's motivating everything, uh, lots and lots of things. But we do not really, like, just watch where we actually use it. We use it to motivate something and it's gonna make one proof easier. Um, so that's, uh, I may even, but we will have to define them. I think I may not have defined I can't, I'm not sure if I've rigorously defined locally ring spaces yet. Okay, speaking of, of, of Jonathan, uh -oh. so here's a great question. So is there a connection between section, the word section you use here, and section as the right inverse of a projection? So when we're talking about sections of ah, sheaves. Right, excellent question. So, right, and so now I need to go to, the, to this picture, which, okay, speaking of Jonathan, great, so, and the answer is yes. You could, you would discuss, you would, what, you, what, what the question is asking. Everyone is, was digging the yellow and orange in the. Ah, great. So this is, and I really wish. Choices of, of colors, by the way. Great. So this is, I know it's hard to see, but. Uh, Maybe you can scroll up a little bit too, if you're, uh, you're, if you're going to talk about that picture. Yes. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Can you see that? I think you can see I can that. see, I can see Jonathan really well, but I can't see the picture so oh, well. Uh, the yellow pic. Okay. Well, uh, this may be, okay, I'm not sure. Let me just talk. Uh, I, I realize I'm confused about something. So there, if the, what the question is saying is, wouldn't it be great if there's some space mapping to your, your base so that the sections are what you said? And the answer is, you can define it. If you take this construction we're describing, you can create a space where the points of the space are all the possible germs or all the stocks. And you glue them together, and now it better be topological space. You need to say what the topology is, uh, and so you do it. Uh, and at some uh, and at some point, you realize that this is this uh, this passage the description. So if you prefer that, and uh, and you reasonably should, although I like making fun of Jonathan, uh, then <laughs> you realize that what that really this is captured in the, in the topological space, which maps to it. So absolutely, you can. And it's not a big leap to do so. And you should then define what it is yourself. I'll, I'll, I'll even tell you, but it's a thing with multiple quantifiers. So you have to be a bit careful. I told you what the set of the space is. It's going to be uh, for, uh, for, uh, over x. The espace, the espace etale uh, for f is, well, you just take all the different stocks and you want to bundle them together uh, into a sheet. Uh, and so you take the all the stocks where uh, and you take like the stock F sub P maps to P. And now that's a set. And now I'm gonna tell you the topological space and we'll just take continuous maps. And I need to tell you what the closed subsets are or what the open subsets are. And I will now basically tell you by saying that honest sections should be continuous. And that's my definition. 
and that's done. And then I've, uh, and I'll say that's the weakest, that, that take the weakest topology or strongest, I always get confused. The weakest topology where that's true, that's your space. And if that confuses you a little bit because you, you're confused about what that actually means, then you're free to ignore it. But I think it does, uh, if you want to think to what it means, it can be really helpful. So that is the espace etale construction, uh, which is useful and it's logically the same, but pictures are always helpful. So I, 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 I will make fun of it, but I think it's completely wise. Great, so, um, so there was a question. So does, uh, so one question was, does sheetification preserve co-limits? And then there was another related question, which was about, um, so let me see. So there was one they were asking about things. Uh, I don't know if I can phrase it right. Why, why don't you work on that one and then we look for the other one. Let me go back to the co-limits and sheetification, which is, uh, right. The, the, I feel like the reason you ask that question is because you know what the answer is heading to because you're thinking correctly. Because sheetification is an adjoint. It's a... Uh, yeah, there was, another, there was another adjoint preservation question that I'm trying to find. And so uh, that's exactly what I was going for. Right, and right adjoint to preserve limits, left thanks to the Rappel thing, which yeah. I uh, learned from, uh, I think, Jason. Uh, and so as a result, and now I have to remember the sheetification is a, uh, right, it's a left adjoint. So left. Yeah, so, so yeah, let me read the other question. So in, here's the other question. In loose terms, it seems that morphisms of sheaves preserve conditions more on the source than on the target. What I mean is that kernel, uh, the kernel is already a sheaf, but the co-kernel and image you have to sheafify. Injectivity conditions between morphisms of stocks and uh, of sheaves are equivalent, but not surjectivity conditions. Uh, the global sections function is left exact, but not right exact. Is there a deeper reason for this? Yes. So then, yeah. <laughs> so, so what came up in the conversation in, in chat was that adjoint pre preservation properties, but then David and Jonathan had some more things to say, which I guess I'm not, well, I I'm wish not they would pick that up right now. Great if they could, uh, I think there is more to say and I'm not, so um, I can say some things. To me, they come under the rubric of how adjoints and limits play with each other, but I'm aware that I'm thinking of them not as a native speaker. And so I, uh, that there's like a, a more general way of understanding of, of saying this. So Jonathan is present and wants to say something, he would be, it would be, and like Emily is on a road trip uh, apparently, so she cannot shed, so we have to have two weeks of non-enlightenment without her, I guess. Of, of the substitute category theorist. Yes, exactly. <laughs> play category theorist on that, uh, even though you're secretly an algebra, you're really an algebra geometer. What I said in the chat was that the inclusion of sheaves and pre-sheaves is uh, a right adjoint so it preserves all limits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it wants to preserve things like kernels, yeah. uh, but not uh, kernels. Oh, God, right. OK, so this is an example of as soon as he says it, it's like obvious to me. And I didn't say it because I, I did not have that realization until he said it, which is sure. I was saying sheaf, right. I was saying sheaf vacation is a left adjoint. So of course, it, uh, 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 it, prefer, it preserves co-limits. But then that also means the forgetful functor is a right adjoint. So it preserves limits. And I should have said that in the same sentence if I was thinking cleanly. Uh, and that's what John said. Yeah, it's the same thing. It is, but I wasn't, but I did not answer the question correctly, meaning I was not, yeah. So I, I think I, I think this is why thinking cleanly can lead you to correct statements. And that was a great, a great example, I think. But, but from this point of view, it's surprising that sheafification should preserve limit, should preserve kernels. Yeah, uh, yes. And I feel like there should be some, yes. Oh. And if someone should say something like, ah, but this. Uh, Fil filtered co-limits. Uh, Sheafification is constructed with a filtered co-limit. That's kind of why. OK, and that's like a constructive. OK, that feels like the, that feels like the first approximation to the right answer, right? Because that, that's the, uh, right. So, so by construction, it's true, which means there's something structural that, uh, yeah, I feel like there's, there's going to be a, an, a next answer after that, which will make me smile even more. Uh, yeah, that, that's great. Great. Do you want to say more, Jonathan, about that? Or is that a, like that was enlightening to me? Uh, no, I only have the first approximation. OK, great.
Okay, so um, there was the observation that your iPad was says Tuesday, January 9th. It also and said there was also the second observation that January 9th was not a day this year. <laughs> January 9th was not. But a apparently day. there's a Zoom bug. Yeah, anyway. uh, so January 9th it was a day this year. I, I remember. Yep, January 9th was a day. Was it, did we not have a January 9th this year? No, no, I think he's the, 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 the Tuesday. No, that's a separate question. Yes. No, this no, is. No, yeah, yeah, we had a January 9th, not a Tuesday. <laughs> I thought I missed something. That's all right. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let's see more math stuff. Um, um, so there is, let's see. Well, I mean, um, okay. So in Yerny Manon's Russian uh, lecture notes on schemes, he pictures spec divided into layers uh, of different dimension and zero being a point at the bottom which he says, uh, which has raised to all other layers dimensions. It's some, uh, it's somewhat different from Mumford's. Any thoughts about this point of view? It really, I think of it as the same thing in the following way, which is how do you draw a picture of, uh, right? So implicit in both of them is dimension theory. Actually, I, I think that, was it Manin or your, uh, who's, uh, which, which notes are these? The, Manin's you're referring to, or uh, so his Russian lecture notes. Oh, Manin's Russian, or some Russian, just yeah, Russian. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, some I think Russian. you're talking about Mumford's Red Book, maybe. Oh, okay, Mumford's Red Book in Russian. No, 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 no. So there's two drawings that that, that I guess are distinct. And that's the, Manin's the, one. Manin's. I didn't know that there was two pictures of spec. Okay, so Manin, so so what's Manin's picture saying? It's oh, a, I guess what he's doing is he draws. Okay, okay. So I think what, what Manin does is he's drawing zero as kind of the whole line, right? And then Mumford always draws these little squiggly points, right? And so that's to indicate that like the whole line is the generic point of-, of uh, I so. think like Manin's point a little bit, uh, point of view is slightly better for because, uh, so Manin's point of view, if I were to say it in terms of what I said, was you start with like, what is C adjoint X, Y, Z when you draw when you're trying to draw the pictures, you start with the old fashioned points and you know where they are. And where do you draw the other ones? Well, how about this one dimension, this thing, which corresponds to y squared equals x cubed. Where does it go? Well, it kind of involves all of those on, on that curve down below. So you mm -hmm. want to think it's that and it kind of is what, that's like one single point that you kind of are thinking of a one single object, one single sort of thing. And then you have all the other one dimensional things and they're contained in two dimensional things. And, through, and so that also hides in it, the dimension theory is visible too. Like for example, you might not, you don't really need the notion of dimension in what we're saying here. Instead, you just have containment of ideals. Uh, and so I, that I like, and Mumford's uh, attempt is to put the point somewhere on the line and you don't know where to put it. Um, and the problem with making it clumpy is that you, that is, that's gonna later on be a good way to picture non-reducedness. And so that's why I feel like you're using up that bit of your brain. And I usually think of it as a, as some, as not, yeah, I think I like Manin's picture better. I, I usually think that where do I put it? It's kind of everywhere or nowhere. And so I think it's like a shadow point that's uh, like, I think of it as a, like a, a lighter. It's like a subset, but. Yeah. Well, it's not a subset. It's like a, it's a, it's a single thing, but it's like the point it's averaged out. Maybe the zero dimensional points are written in black and the one dimensional ones are kind of grayish and the two dimensional ones are lighter still and so forth. And they each have the same amount of pointness to it. That makes no sense, but I like it. Okay, so here, here's another question is, uh, so what do you lose when you work with M spec instead of spec and why M spec instead of spec? Uh, uh, will we be working with M spec at other times in spec? And so can you define a scheme only using M spec as a model? Or can you define, oh. I guess, a, a category of geometric objects? Okay, that's like five, okay, five different questions. So the first was- yeah, but Tell me about M spec. Versus spec, okay, right. So M, is M spec better than, why is M spec, why is M spec better than spec? Why is spec better than M spec? And uh, so let me answer them in some order. One is that uh, for algebraic enclosed fields, uh, M spec, uh, uh, hmm, where do I start? Uh, let me first say that M spec, in the case of algebraic enclosed fields, will have the same information as spec. And that's a non-trivial, non-Stalin-Sachs statement to, uh, to figure out. So in other words, when you 
I would think about it in the following way, which is if you were to talk to some 19th century century geometer, uh, they would be thinking M spec and you'd be thinking spec perhaps, and nothing you would say would be different, although the set would be different if you're thinking of. And, and so now we're talking about things we're not supposed to talk about, like topoi and sites and things like this. That somehow it's the same notion, even though you may add or have additional points. If you have non-algebraic enclosed fields, it's what you should have wanted before. There is no difference between M spec and spec, but your geometric picture in your head might be different. And then finally, if you're not finally generated algebras over a field, like the integers or something else, um, the integers may be a bad example, uh, uh, then M spec and spec are not the same thing. Uh, like you actually lose information. The reasons why you want prime idea, you want to deal with those extra kinds of points. So um, for example, uh, Hmm. This is the sort of thing you will. So, okay, maybe I'll say the, the one question is will we be working with M spec instead of spec or as well as spec? And the answer is it depends on you. Uh, like, I, I'm hopefully setting this up so you pick the category you want to work in and it's going to work. And then if you end up wanting to turn on or turn off some feature, it'll do so with no change whatsoever. And then at some point, you want to ask yourself, wait, what, what do I gain or lose by uh, dealing with spec of the string rather than, rather than M spec? So you should want to ask that. And a related thing is if you have a complex analytic projective variety, a subspace of projective end space that's complex analytic, it turns out magically that it's the same as something cut out by polynomials. This is Sayer's Gaga theorem. And the magic of this theorem isn't just how short, uh, how that it's true, it's his proof, which is just really elegant. And it's especially elegant when the reason it's elegant is because he uses this formalism, which makes it so clean. And he invents the formalism. It's not like he took this beautiful point of view and said, look, what you can do with it. He invented this point of view. The notion of flatness first appeared in that paper, uh, uh, for example. So, uh, so the answer is yes, uh, that yes, uh, uh, you can do all of these at once if you think about it the right way. And the right, and if you think of everything as just different sorts of geometric spaces all at once. And that's the, uh, so really you should do varieties first, but given that we're not, you might as well do them all at the same time and think of them the same way. So I don't okay. know if that's the question at all or the moral of the question, but that's. I think it's good. Um, so there's another thing that I think we should talk about with generic points. And there was a little bit of confusion about generic points being like a, a point at infinity, like in some sort of compactification. And Great. so maybe we should just say that's not at all. Exactly. It's not, it is, yeah. exactly. I, I put it out there. I draw it out there because I have nowhere else to put it. Uh, yeah. I, and that's, that's lack of imagination. And but I guess- we're not compactifying or anything like that. Exactly. Yeah. Not compactifying. The extra point is not, it's not like projective space. It's just a point somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and that's what, and Manin has a different answer. He puts a point on top. Uh, 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 so that's an example of dealing with the problem in a different way. Exactly. It's a point we just don't know where exactly to put it. We know where it isn't, but we don't know exactly where to, to put it because there's no one works on the page. Okay, so here's a question about, another question about drawings is, uh, how does one visually differentiate between prime ideals, which are contained in exactly the same set of maximal ideals? Aha. Uh -huh. so I can't think of. Uh, and so, so the question is, is, can, is so that, like in a draw if we're trying to draw something in in there's say a prime ideal that's that's containing the exact same set of maximal ideals so because the maximal ideals are points that's what he's worried about and that's you know what so we can really how, draw. so the, let me say what's behind this question and this is a proof that whoever asked the question the geometric idea is leading to an algebraic insight that they may not have had before which is so this is Devong Agrawal oh good right. nicely done uh, so this is so the so the reason you have a hard time visualizing it means that you have a theorem in mind, which is that for a variety, uh, the prime ideal should be determined by the maximum ideals containing it. And this is not necessarily true for things where your geometric intuition breaks down. So for, in general, your geometric intuition works for things where algebra can close fields. And then with some training, it works almost as is for over an arbitrary field. And with more training, it basically works for the integers, but you have some sense, or for arbitrary rings, but you have some sense where it breaks down. So whoever, yeah, right. So he should prove the theorem. He has a, th he stated a theorem, something which has got to be a theorem, which is um, a prime ideal is the intersection of the maximum ideals containing it for nice rings. That's the tr algebraic translation. Yeah. 
Jacobson. I, okay, there's a notion, a notion of a Jacobson ring. I don't know whether... So prime ideals are their own Jacobson radical, I guess is the statement, right? So... I would like to argue that... Okay, it's going to be like espace tele, so Jonathan's going to yell at me. Like, I feel like well, uh, you could look up the notion of Jacobson ring. Uh, I'm not sure whether you need to, uh, but it's, it is the... Uh, yeah, yeah, so oh, great. So so feel free to look up the notion of Jacob's ring. How's that? Okay, okay. So um okay, hey, let's move on from that. So uh so what happens when we start sticking into ring spaces non-commutative rings? And why don't we ever see um you know ring spaces with non-commutative rings in them? Well, I don't know about the we part. You know, people see them for sure. And, and but then your question, yes, absolutely. Uh, so the phrase non-commutative geometry means different things to different people. Uh, like there are five or six different meanings of this phrase, not all of which commute with each other. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but if you want to study rings, the, uh, modern commutative algebra uh, explicitly or implicitly also is under, uh, went through this growth and deification. And so non-commutative algebra is absolutely, it's like this long ongoing multiple projects of understanding them geometrically. And we have picked the end somehow to a greater or lesser extent, we have pictures of mildly non-commutative things. And, and so you want everything we're saying, you can try to extend non-commutative rings and some things work as is, other things work with effort, other things work conjecturally and other things you have to sort of give up. So the answer is yes, that's the, absolutely the right question to ask. And the, but because you need, maybe as a good example, we don't, we're, we're one week away from saying this, but if you have a map of rings, you get a map of geometric space in the other direction. Uh, and so if you have non-commutative rings, the center of a non-commutative ring sits in the commutative ring. So the geometric space, the hypothetical geometric space, non-commutative geometric space maps to spec of the center. And so that's how you should picture. You should picture the spec, something geometric that you can visualize and some thing that you have to learn how to develop intuition for above it that captures the non-commutativity. So that's a good question. That's like the, exactly the right kind of question to ask and then uh, to try to answer over decades. All right. Uh, so there's another question that Jonathan posted, but I don't, uh, so he's looking at um, like C to the N plus one minus zero mod C star. He's asking why is the quotient pre sheaf a sheaf? Why isn't the quotient pre sheaf a sheaf? But right. I don't see how this is a sheaf. Uh, anyway, you understand that question? I do. So, so let okay, me okay. Let, let me give an example. Uh, I have to say, I think this example was okay. This is the universal. Okay, I, I need to say this in several ways. One is that I, I first heard this from Brian Conrad, and it's an obvious. Once he said it, it's like a really clear thing. So what I'm about to say works. It's not about algebraic geometries. It works for manifolds as well. Uh, it works for. Uh, so I will give you a map to projective space. That's not the same as a map to C to the n plus one minus the origin mod C star. And the map is take projective space and map it to itself by the identity. You cannot describe that as a map from projective space to C to the n plus one minus the origin and then mod out by this equivalence relation. That you, uh, you cannot lift that map to a map to C to the n plus one minus the origin. So kind of the universal thing that like the the, the, the thing that maps projective space that captures that information the most is exactly that. But maybe, and now the challenge is if you want to then think about this over, mm. so, but if you did want to think about this over nice contractible subsets or open subsets of R to the N, then it might work. Uh, oh, uh, contractible subsets, then it might work. And the question is like, you can make other examples like this. And an example might be if you have Projective space maps projective space integer valued maps of projective space you know what they are but things maps projective space from number from rings of integers and number fields with non-zero class groups for people who know what they are line bundles that are non-trivial you get weird maps projective space that are not of the form you think so this is uh, I, this will take some a little bit of time to say so but maybe in Zulip later at some point a discussion can happen about that. But the projective space gives you the universal example. If you, as long as you're allowing that in your class of geometric spaces, it's something uh, where you don't have sheepification. Okay, so here's another question. Uh, so do you think growth and was guided by geometry or trying to make notions as general abstract as possible 
in the geometry happen to follow? No, I don't think either. <laughs> I mean, well, guy, <laughs> was he guided by geometry? Uh, it, it, I think there's no reasonable, you can make an unreasonable definition of geometry, which he might make of geometry, uh, that under which that could be yes, but no reasonable person's definition of geometry would that be true? But nor was he trying to make things as general as possible. He was just trying to understand, I, okay, can I speak for growth and make? Well, he's dead now, so I guess I can. Uh, and you can contradict me, but, uh, but for sure I know, 100% sure I'm gonna get it wrong and that he would rise from the grave and I don't know, like cross the ocean and throttle me. Uh, but he was trying to understand things. And when you try to understand things, there's sort of points of view that are very general that you want to put things into. And this is the general, the geometric topological, uh, uh, it just naturally fits into single point of view. And he doesn't need to express it with pictures, I guess. I, I don't know whether he drew pictures on the board when he spoke. So I would say the answer is he wasn't just trying to make things as general as possible. His, some of his followers, the apostates, the, like the false prophets afterwards, uh, w w saw what he did and said, ah, yes, he made things very general. So that's the goal, to make things as general as possible. And he, but he was making things general for a reason. He was trying to prove, he was trying to actually prove things and understand things. And he had visions as to how it should go. And I, I should also say that there's people like Miles Reed who are, would it, would adamantly say that it was not tied to geometry, right? Yeah. Well, I think that's because for Miles, he uses geometry, right? Yeah, he, he is a geo right. He's like very good at geometric thinking and exactly, and he draws pictures yeah. of high dimensional, right? And he's drawing pictures of things that people didn't draw pictures of before, uh, or uh, he drew pictures. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But he also Miles, like he was a student of Deline, like he. Miles got geometry from this, right? Reed got geometry from this. So this is, so, uh, so that's what I mean by, he wasn't using geometry in the way that normal people like Miles Reed would describe geometry or you or I, or I. but he certainly was doing some, he was distilling ideas that were geometric, that were, that Reed would identify as geometric out of it. So I agree with him. And also Reed would say the same thing, I, that delicious quote in one of his books and in the introduction about theses in Paris in the mid 1970s of, that were about yeah. If it wasn't, if it didn't have something in it, then it was crap. What would you say? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And so some of the things got more and more abstract, uh, and the best things are abstract with good reason. Uh, or like the natural setting for this was coherent sheaves on something, or oh, I forgot what it was. Yeah. And I, I should say I'm not like opposed to things that have those words in the title, but they should have a reason, uh, and often they do. But sometimes they don't. Like I feel like that's the uh, uh, that's the you should always ask whether you. And I feel like the people I learn the most from, who speak that language, are actually very grounded. Like they have examples of everything, and they can say fancy words I don't understand, but they understand the fancy words because they their hands are are, are deep in the dirt. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so there was a follow up uh, about the this maximal ideals. Uh, question the maximal ideals determining prime ideals question and so I've seen the proof that polynomial rings so this is Devon uh, I've seen the proof that polynomial rings over fields are Jacobson but I was curious if there were places where we encounter rings which aren't as nice if not then why incl include it in the definition of schemes somehow oh so here's a ring that's not Jacobson uh, a DVR a discrete sorry a discrete valuation ring or the piatics like that's a uh, like those are things you want, right? I mean, I would think you want uh, to consider, and they are useful uh, yeah. geometrically, uh, algebraically. So uh, that's why I don't like the notion of like Jacobson ring is an, like that notion. Okay, now this time, okay, John. Here you go. Uh, like if you take a high dimension, just a local ring, right? Yeah. Yeah, just take any local ring that you want, and there's plenty of you know once you intersect with the maximal ideal, then yep. you're yeah. Yeah, and the pictures that you draw there is just like you have the point and you draw all the varieties going, If say if you localize, you draw all the little varieties going through it. There's a great picture that's in Mumford's Red Book of what localizations should look like. In right, and I should say Mumford's, it's a, it, yeah, I guess this is why the picture behind Allison's head, which is Mumford's picture, yeah. of, uh, is right, this is where picture, such pictures arrived, I think first, this is Mumford, uh, and Mumford proves abstract things 
but with pictures in his head. So that's Mumford was thinking geometrically in the Miles Reed sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you're, yeah, so in particular, that's, that's why if someone tells you Jacobson rings are important, then you'll pay attention to them in a certain way. But they're important precisely and only for one reason. Uh, and I'll, uh, so I think you should be, you should learn about them only when you're forced, when you, when it's forced upon you rather than to take them. Otherwise you might stick them in the definition of a scheme, which is the kind of mistake people made in the early part of the 20th century. They'd had these hypotheses that were not necessary because they're not important. Yeah. The other part that I missed was there was a suggestion that, uh, so about this non-commutative thing, I forgot about this part, was that sheaves of differential operators. Yes. Well, okay, here's a really basic thing, which I, I, I brought up actually in, with well, quote basic in, in, uh, in, when teaching like the beginnings of representation theory. Take a nice group, a non commutative group like GL2. Take its ring of, uh, so take its group algebra. It's not commutative. Uh, you want spec of it. What does that have to do with the ring of represent with the representation? Ring? So take a spec of the center of the group algebra uh, and draw it. And you realize you're drawing a picture of the representations, of the, of the irreducible representations. And the representations are somehow present in there too. So some of all the pictures, that's an example of representation theory present in the same place as non commutative geometry and Jacobson rings, if you want. <laughs> and uh, uh, zero, it's zero dimensional, like it's a very, but yeah. Yeah, it's kind of amazing to watch. I, I find it surprising. Okay, so here's a, here's another thing. So when learning sheafification, something about a plus construction um, that uh, if you apply it, something about a plus construction that if you apply it twice uh, gives sheafification, but you don't need to do it twice. How does it? Uh, how does that relate to this approach? So sorry, that was a terrible reading of this. No, yeah, I'm sorry, that was actually my question. I vaguely remember there's something that called a plus construction, which is sort of some naive way of sheafification. It doesn't work. It only gives you one of the sheaf axioms, but then if you apply it twice, it does work. Um, how is that related? So this? I deliberately, yeah. So I found that confusing before in life. Uh, so I, uh, so I can after the fact say what it means, but I feel like, and I feel like the people who first say it. Yeah, I feel like people don't actually need to know this. It's just, I was curious. Um. Yeah, but I think it's, I think after the fact, I now understand it as follows. Like, right, it's this neat thing that you do it once and you get the first of the axioms and you do it a second time and it takes you from the first to the second. And then later there's a notion of stackification, which is one level higher, which is just the same thing. It's, you, it's got three steps and you get the first, second, and third. And so what's going on? Well, here's what's going on, I think, which is um, in chief, maybe in terms of compatible stocks. Uh, so maybe uh, you can say what the plus construction is? No, uh, okay. I can't remember. Uh, I, I also do not remember what the plus construction is. Yeah. And that to me is a reason why, I mean, I will tell you what it does, <laughs> but, but that tells me why I don't like it. Uh, right, I feel like I should, if I can't remember it, it can't be that easy for me. Uh, but uh, here's what it does when you do it the first time. When you go, for, um, so you have a map when you have compatible stocks. The first thing you do with compatible stocks is you, well, actually, yeah, let me, this may be useful for experts only, uh, uh, but that's okay, because experts are asking. So, so I think this is the last question, by the way. So, oh, um, right. anyway, so okay, good. So let me end with this expert. Or is there one you want to give out? Oh, there, there's one more, there's one more. Okay, so there's one about, it's, it's about related to sheaves, sheafification as well. Let me do, okay, let me do that one and then I'll do the plus construction after that, how's that? Okay, so let me find it again. Oh, I just scrolled. Um, oh, oh, where was the Jonathan question? Okay, so is it correct to say that identity in, the identity and glueability axioms on a pre-sheaf correspond to injectivity and surjectivity of sh? Of the map show. Yes, if I understand correctly, I get this. That's good because this fits perfectly in with this. Yeah. Yes, if I understand correctly, or at least one of them is correct, and the other is correct once the first one holds. Since in terms of that order of, uh, uh, that I, so maybe they're both individually correct. I guess they might be individually, uh, but the depending on how you say it, the glueability axiom that I really think of one, and then uh, I, uh, I really think of it in that order. Uh, so there was, a, let me also say um, that uh, there's, there's another, ex there's an extended discussion of this in the uh, stream too. Ah, good. I think, so I think uh, Jonathan and DZB talked about this a bit. Oh, good. Great. I'm curious to see what they say because they would say interesting things too. So uh, uh, I'll go later and look at that. So here, so here's the plus construction. So here's sheepification in a way that generalizes stackification, which is 
You have, what's the identity axiom? It says that sameness glues. Uh, the identity axiom says that if f and g are the same on each of these, uh, on, on, the, on each of these uh, open sets on the cover, then that their, their sameness locally glues to something globally. Uh, and then, so, 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 the, so sameness glues, and the glueability axiom is that objects glue. Uh, and then for, uh, so for stacks, there's like a third level like that too. Uh, and so if same, so the first thing that you do is you take your, so, um, so I see the first level of plus construction is you first impose sameness gluing. So you, so you, so in other words, if things are locally the same, you make them the same. So when you do that, you are losing objects because you're identifying, you're getting fewer objects because you are identifying them. And then the second level after you've done that, uh, is you gain objects. You don't lose any objects because you are taking, uh, uh, because you are, now you, now you already have your sameness worked out and you're adding new things that are glued out of local things. And so if, for those who know what stacks are, this happens one level, this is the same sort of thing where you take, you take one kind of morphism then the next, then the next lower and the next order way, uh, like that. So the plus construction is somehow doing that. In effect, if sameness is already if sameness already glues, it'll make the objects glue. Uh, and that's, I think, the flavor of what the plus construction is doing. Then you could define it. And I, the fact that I can't remember it makes me not want to remember it. But is that sort of, Allison, does that sort of answer why? I mean, basically, I'm agreeing with you and not remembering it. Yes. <laughs> I, I think the, the plus construction uh, takes all compatible local uh, data from your sheaf. But that sounds like compatible. Stop. But but the the compatibility uh, uh, came from the the old pre sheaf, so so you you kind of fixed the um, equality the, the identity axiom in the first step, and then you fix the glueability in the second. But because the glueability depends on the identity axiom, uh, it doesn't necessarily fix the glueability in the first step. Okay, so I think. I understand that as well as I probably should or want to. <laughs> so, so once we know, in other words, once someone once someone says the definition, I would look at it and say, "Ah, yes, that does exactly what Jonathan is saying." That that that's the. Uh, maybe here's a question about that. Since I know we've had our last question, this may be my question to you, which is, do you think we should care about the plus construction? And uh, when I say plus construction, there's the Quillen plus construction, which everyone should care about apparently. But uh, I mean, this plus should is this in the in the in the dust heap of history, or is it something which, uh, like, Jonathan, do you do you do you like, again? Someone, I feel like someone I, somewhere on Zoom should make the case. I, I I think if you uh, if you want to sheafify on a growth unique topology, you need to to know that it exists somehow. That is a good point. Right. So if you don't have points, enough points, yeah. uh, then okay, great. So if you don't have enough points, what do you do? And the answer is maybe you have to do this. Although still, one would hope you could do. It. Uh, but maybe you can't. Um, okay, so I could believe that it's possible that this is a useful construction, but if you're making this definition for old fashioned sheaves only because you have in mind later on working in a growth in topology uh, uh, that has not enough points, or I mean, that's that's like the wrong reason for that. But I, oh, good. So at some point, I may actually care about plus construction mm -hmm. here, uh, Jonathan says. So I, I could believe that I might care later. Okay, so I think that's uh, it, right? Unless uh, Allison and Jonathan have anything, you guys have any more? Okay, Great. cool. Great, so in that case, we'll call it a day from this bonus round and we'll meet again uh, virtually in this sense in a week, but uh, uh, otherwise I will hopefully browse through Zillow and see uh, and jump into a very interesting conversation. Okay, thanks everyone. I'll, and I will see you all soon. Yep, thanks. See you next week. <laughs>